Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. My name is Joel Reese, and I represent the faculty as the chair of the Faculty Advisory Committee. Today, we are honored to present the David O. McKay Lecture during this normally scheduled devotional hour. Next week, our devotional speaker will be Elder Paul V. Johnson, General Authority 70 and Commissioner of the Church Educational System. We appreciate all of those who have worked to put on this event and would like to acknowledge those with us on the stand today. President John Tanner and his wife, Susan Tanner. This year's David O. McKay Lecture, Dr. Marcus Martins and his wife, Miriam Martins, Academic Vice President John Bell, and members of the Faculty Advisory Committee participating in this program. We also welcome all of you in the audience to this historic 2020 David O. McKay Lecture, and thank you for being here. We will now begin with an invocation by Dr. Susan Barton, professor from the Faculty of Math and Computing. Our Father, who art in heaven, we come before thee at this meeting with much gratitude in our hearts for the opportunity we have to be here we thank thee, Father, for a prophet, David O. McKay, and his diligence and vigilance in education and his prophetic insight and vision for this university nearly a hundred years ago. We thank thee, Father, for Marcus and for his preparation. We pray that thou will bless him and help him that the ideas may come to his mind that he wants to share with us this day. We pray also, Father, for a blessing upon us as we listen, that we may be edified, that the Holy Ghost may bear witness to us of the truths that we are being taught, and that we may feel of the Spirit and be guided. We thank thee for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and for all that he has made possible for us in his atoning sacrifice and his resurrection. We pray now, Father, that thou will go with us throughout this day and remember thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Dr. Barton. We will now announce the 2021 David O. McKay Lecture for next year. All faculty members were invited to submit nominations. After careful consideration and approval from the President's Council, a faculty member was chosen. It is my pleasure to announce next year's David O. McKay Lecture for 2021, Dr. Troy Smith. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We look forward to your address a year from now. In a moment, we will invite President John Tanner to come forward and present an award to this year's 2020 David O. McKay Lecture, Dr. Marcus Martins. Following the award presentation by President Tanner, we will hear from John Bell, our Academic Vice President, to introduce our speaker. After, Dr. After Dr. Martins has concluded his lecture, Dr. Brent Green, Associate Professor from the Faculty of Education and Social Work will then offer our benediction. President Tanner. Thank you, Joel. On the back of your program, you will notice a list of David O. McKay lecturers. It's a long list. We invite any past David O. McKay lecturers that are in attendance today to please, please stand and be recognized. We invite your applause. Thank you very much. We welcome your attendance here today. Today, we are adding another distinguished member of the faculty to this group that you see on the back of your program. Dr. Marcus Martins, will you please join me? Dr. Martins has consistently demonstrated what it means to be a David O. McKay lecturer. 
He has been nominated by fellow faculty members and approved by the President's Council. The title of the David O. McKay Lecture is one of the highest honors that can be bestowed upon the faculty members here at BYU-Hawaii. We look forward to hearing your uh, insights today from your field of study and reflections on gospel study. I uh, want to now present this beautiful plaque to you and an award certificate and check. And, and we invite your applause. And may I just say, Oh, yes, that's good. And because we share a common language, I want to say parabéns. Obrigado. <laughs> Thank you, President. Aloha, brothers and sisters. It's a great privilege to be able to introduce to you Dr. Marcus Martins. He's a great friend, and, and I'm looking forward to his lecture, as I know you are as well. Marcus H. Marchins holds degrees in business management, organizational behavior, and sociology. He comes originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, and prior to moving to the United States, he worked as a system uh, analyst, a project manager, and as a freelance consultant. After arriving in the U.S., he taught at BYU in Provo and also at Ricks College, which is now BYU-Idaho, before moving to BYU-Hawaii in the year 2000. He has been honored here as Teacher of the Year and as Honored Professor of the Year. He is the author of the 2007 book entitled Setting the Record Straight, Blacks and the Mormon Priesthood. He has written the manuscript also for a second book entitled The Priesthood, Earthly Symbols, and Heavenly Realities. Brother Marchins joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1972 with his parents, and he became the first Latter-day Saint with black African ancestry to serve a full-time mission for the church after the 1978 revelation. Since then, he has served multiple times as bishop, stake high counselor, and temple ordinance worker. He has also served as a translator of the Book of Mormon and as president of the Brazil Sao Paulo North Mission with his wife, uh, Miriam Abeline Barbosa Martins. The couple was married in 1980, and they have four children and eight, eight grandchildren. And I'm also going to uh, indulge a little bit in some personal reflection about Dr. Martins before we listen to his talk. It turns out that uh, almost 45 years ago in 1976, uh, when I was a teenager and he was a teenager as well, he uh, came to my hometown to visit. And while he was there, uh, we got to spend some time together, and I got to know him a little bit. And uh, it was a great experience, and I can remember that from nearly 45 years ago because of the following. Uh, while he was there, he talked to me about the priesthood. And he talked about how important it was to him. Um, at that time, he was not, it was not available for him to hold the priesthood. And yet he spoke of it in terms that made me realize that uh, he cared much more deeply about that sacred office than, than at the time I did. And for me, it was a game changer. I, I, uh, I thought about that deeply, and it had great influence on how I thought about the priesthood after that moment and since that time. And I'll always be grateful to him for, the, for those conversations that we had way back when we were, when we were 17 years old and uh, for the influence it has had in my life since. I believe he's had that same kind of influence on many people, many of you here as, as students. And so uh, you'll feel his spirit today as he shares his insights. 
I invite you now to welcome Dr. Martin, uh, Marcus Martins. Aloha. President Tanner, Vice President Bell, deans, colleagues on the faculty and staff, students, friends, and family, thank you for your support and attendance today. I also thank the Faculty Advisory Committee for their efforts. I feel honored and blessed to have been selected as the David McKay Lecturer this year, and I congratulate Dr. Troy Smith uh, for his nomination for next year, and wish you many good nights of sleep. Thank you, Brother Bell, for that introduction. And so since you indulged uh, in some personal reflections, I'm going to take a few seconds here to do the same. That experience Brother Bell and I had in 1976 in Los Angeles was also very formative to me. I came to the United States as a teenager, of course, with a lot of stereotypes about Americans. But that one day we spent together, he, he took me to his high school, we spent an entire day together, blew a lot of those stereotypes and threw them out of the window. So those were experiences that I never forgot. I never forgot. And so when we meet again here, oh, it's, it's been a delight. I also remember that at that time, it was the first time uh, in January of 1976, that I spoke in English in a sacrament meeting in his ward. And I remember distinctively John Bell sitting on the sacrament table to my left. Right after that trip, I started dating my uh, sweetheart, Miriam. And here we are, after, all, after over four decades, with um, speaking again, and uh, John Bell to my right, my, now my wife to my left. This is really a special occasion for me. I hope my speech will honor the memory of a prophet of the Lord and the high standards set by the 56 men and women who preceded me and also the efforts and trust of many dedicated colleagues. I thank you heartily for all the prayers and all the well wishes. Thank you very much. Thank also those, both those who voted for my nomination as well as those who worked very hard preparing all the arrangements for this event. This is the third time I'm honored to speak to the entire BYU Hawaii Ohana. As I ponder on what to present at this time, I recall the topics of my previous talks to our campus. At a devotional in 2001, I discussed the potential problem of false images of Christ. At a university convocation in 2005, I focused my remarks on President David McKay's vision regarding our graduate, graduates' role in establishing peace internationally in a violent world. This time, I chose to revisit a theme that has permeated my writings for over two decades, my personal expectations for the not too distant future of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As far back as 1998, I have been visualizing how geopolitical, social, cultural, and technological trends might affect missionary and temple work in the early 21st century. Of course, these have been mere intellectual exercises that in no way carry nor aim for any official endorsement from the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In fact, President Harry B. Eyring once joked that many high priests in the church think that they know as much or more about the future of the church than the Council of the First Presence and the Quorum of the Twelve. Still, I find encouragement in the words of the prophet Joseph Smith who said, it is the privilege of every elder to speak of the things of God. And could we all come together with one heart and one mind in perfect faith, the veil might as well be rent today as next week or any other time. So with those, with those two statements in mind, I'm taking my chances. Maybe I will end up providing hearty laughter to the brethren who might then send me a message saying, good job, Brother Martins. We suggest you keep it. One evening about 15 years ago, I was in my home right here in Laia, chatting with the father of two of our students from Brazil. He and his wife had not accepted the visit of the missionaries, but they allowed their daughters to be baptized, come to BYU Hawaii, and later serve full-time missions. I was then serving as his daughter's bishop, 
And that evening, he told me that in the past, he had been concerned about his daughter's association with the church. He then said the following, Brother Martins, as I saw my daughters in church yesterday, both active and articulate, I came to the realization that whoever joins this church only stands to gain from it. Since that conversation in 2005, I have been pondering on the idea that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we practice what I call an intelligent religion. But before explaining on my, on, on my thing, allow me to review my definition for these two key concepts, church and religion, by quoting from my own convocation speech from 2005. Some time ago, I noticed the absence of the word religion in those revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants in which the Lord speaks to the prophet Job Smith. Whenever the Lord referred to the elements constituting his kingdom on the earth, he used words such as articles, covenants, doctrine, church, gospel, kingdom, and law, but not religion. The words church and religion are often used interchangeably, but for the purpose of my analysis, I will establish a distinction between them. So I will define church as an organization established by revelation for the salvation and exaltation of the human family. It is the earthly repository of oracles, doctrines, principles, laws, covenants, and ordinance revealed from heaven, and the priesthoods with their associated keys necessary to teach those doctrines, principles, and laws, to officiate ordinances, and to administer covenants. I refer to these elements as components of the church, and I define religion as the lifestyle developed by individuals and families as they follow or practice the components of the church. Therefore, we can say that while the church has a divine origin, the religion practiced by members of the church in their daily lives has a largely human origin, and it can be attributed to a social group with their contact with and understanding of their sacred texts and experiences guiding their behavior and worldviews. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints began in 1830, but the religion associated with it, or the human response to a contact with the divine, began when Joseph Smith Jr. had his first vision and conversation with God the Father and his son Jesus Christ in 1820, and had his worldview and his personal assessment of his behavior and expectations forever affected by that heavenly manifestation. In the title of my remarks, I use the, word, the term intelligent as a derivative of intelligence, defining the scriptures in Revelation as the glory of God, light, and truth. As you can see, my theme is not about the next century of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an organization, since without prophetic insight, it's virtually impossible to predict future organizational developments. As a new convert almost half a century ago, I used to hear other members of the church state that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was perfect and that it had answers to all kinds of questions. Today, rather than claim structural perfection, which by nature is unchanging and static, I prefer to say that the organizational structure of the church will always be perfectly and dynamically adapted to the needs of its worldwide membership as they participate in the divine work of salvation under a myriad of local circumstances. And I sense that in general, we have reached a level of maturity that allows us to state without concern that there are quite a few important questions for which we still have no answers. Therefore, rather than focus on organizational matters, I will share with you my current vision of possibilities that will no doubt be available to my grandchildren and two generations of my family after them. Let me start by explaining in detail my rationale for calling the individual religious practice of a faithful Latter-day Saint an intelligent religion. Years ago, as I reflected on our traditional approach to proselytizing and conversion, 
I was impressed in a new way by Moroni's invitation to the future readers of the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. I would exhort you that when you shall read these things, ponder it in your hearts. And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, he may know the truth of all things. I still find it remarkable that the first two steps in Morona's invitation are to read and ponder. Language and analysis are then followed by prayer and eventual divine revelation. And what I find even more remarkable is the knowledge that the Almighty God wants to communicate with his beloved children in intelligible ways. I, I recall a conversation with a colleague from another faith back in, in my hometown, Rio de Janeiro, back in 1986, in which he expressed his disagreement with the concept of divine revelation. He said, if God were to speak to me, there's no way I would be able to understand what he would say. That would be impossible. I tried to assure him that that, was, that that was not the case to no avail. In fact, he was so adamant on his disbelief that he threatened to end our friendship if I were to insist that I had been the recipient of heavenly communication. And yet, that's precisely what the Lord has stated in these latter days. Behold, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me and were given unto my servants in their weakness after the manner of their language that they might come to understanding. Now, when a man reasoneth, he is understood of men because he reasoneth as a man. Even so will I, the Lord, reason with you that you may understand. And the Lord does not stop there. He inspires his children to higher levels of reasoning through the power of the Holy Ghost. For you shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. For the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. And the spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world. And the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit. And every one that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit cometh unto God, even the Father. And the Father teacheth him of the covenant which he has renewed and confirmed upon you, which is confirmed upon you for your sakes, and not for your sakes only, but for the sake of the whole world. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you are little children, and you have, you, have not yet as, uh, you have not as yet understood how great blessings the Father hath in his own hands and prepared for you. And you cannot bear all things now. Nevertheless, be of good cheer, for I will lead you along. And so for the last 200 years, the Lord has been leading his people along by direct, com direct communication. At first he spoke or sent heavenly messengers to speak in his name only to Joseph Smith Jr., then to both Joseph and Oliver Cowdery. Not, only after, not, not long after that, he added David Whitman and Martin Harris to the list, to the list of latter-day recipients of heavenly communications. After the organization of the church, the Lord offered his revelations to the entire membership, as the prophet Joseph declared. God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve, and even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. I like this prophetic statement very much. Yet it seems to me that often members of the church tend to focus almost exclusively on the last part of the statement by repeating the old cliche, we're not prepared for greater knowledge. I utterly reject that belief. Contemplating the world around us and the amazing, almost miraculous technological developments of the last century, how is it possible that we cannot be prepared for greater spiritual insights? How can we see as normal the fact that we have reached such developments in multiple sciences and yet remain, generally speaking, kindergartners in gospel scholarship? 
So yes, I believe that the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, has fixed priorities on what to reveal to his, to his children. But I also believe that we are mentally and intellectually prepared for ever-increasing levels or magnitudes of light and truth or intelligence from on high, if it be the Lord's will to grant them to us. As we consider the currently available scriptures and the words of living prophets, we often hear longtime members say that eh, it's always the same stuff. But I believe that if we study in greater detail the knowledge we have already been given, that same old stuff can prove to be surprisingly fresh. But how can we see these same old concepts become surprisingly fresh or new to us? Allow me to focus on one fundamental aspect of gospel scholarship, the divine language. I suggest that we will find this greater intelligence veiled in the symbolic language found in the scriptures and in the words of Latter-day Prophets. Just as in the case of the Savior Jesus Christ's parables, this method of teaching encapsulates or veils divine insights and perfect symbols uh, and perfect principles in earthly symbols that can be under easily understood and explored in ever-increasing depths by mortal minds. This is for our eternal benefit, as the prophet Joseph Smith taught. The relationship we have with God places us in a situation to advance in knowledge. He has power to institute laws to instruct the weaker intelligences that they may be exalted with himself so that they might have one glory upon another and all that knowledge, power, glory, and intelligence which is requisite in order to save them in the world of spirits. This is good doctrine. It tastes good. Language is so central to God's work of salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is known as the Word. And he stated that all things were created by the Word of his power. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and prepositions become tools like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in the great school of heavenly matters. Titles, metaphors, and allegories demand intelligent analysis in order to unlock and reveal the eternal truths about God's relationship with and designs for his children. The entire spiritual dimension of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, which included divine guidance, spiritual gifts, and the exercise of priesthood, power, and authority, requires language. All sacred ordinances, covenants, and revelations provided to mortals are presented through language. Communication with God through prayer, even when in thought, is mediated by language. The exercise of the priesthood itself is inextricably linked to language. Key terminology in sacred ordinances function as a kind of source code to bless the human family and implement the saving mission of the Church of Jesus Christ in mortality. Other key words and invocations unlock powers, honors, and privileges, some yet to be completely understood. Since the spoken word is ephemeral, it can be given permanence by writing and the power of the Holy Ghost. At times, the scriptures describe language being used in some rather thought-provoking ways. For example, during the Apostle John's great vision of the throne of God and the future of the earth, at least four times he heard voices accompanied by thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. He also saw and heard resurrected alien animals speaking and praising God. Enoch spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and mount the mountains fled, even according to his command, and the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. In the Book of Mormon, we read that when the resurrected Savior Jesus Christ visited the Nephites and Lamanites, a multitude of about 2,500 people testified that Jesus prayed to the Father, speaking great and marvelous things which they saw and heard. These statements have been in my mind for a long time. Voices associated with thunder, lightning, and earthquakes. 
a powerful language that commands changes in the physical environment and seeing and hearing a prayer from a member of the Godhead. Some might say that I'm interpreting this passage too literally, but one of the lessons I learned when I retranslated the Book of Mormon into Portuguese in the early 1980s is that we must trust the terminology used by the prophets. At times, some of those words and expressions may not make much sense in our days, but they may convey ideas that will be understood and appreciated by others years or decades later. That reminds me of the words from the prophet Joseph Smith about the powerlessness of the existing mortal languages. The things that are written are only hints of things which exist in the prophet's mind which are not written concerning eternal glory. O oh Lord, when will the time come when we may stand together and gaze upon eternal wisdom engraven upon the heavens until we may read the sound of eternity to the fullness and satisfaction of our immortal souls. O oh Lord, deliver us in due time from the little, narrow prison, almost as it were total darkness of paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect language. Yet the Lord wants his people to be educated about things both in heaven and in the earth and under the earth. And he added, that you may be prepared in all things to magnify the calling where I have called you, by study and also by faith. That being the case, how can we use our imperfect mortal languages to explore the seemingly infinite domain of earthly and heavenly things and serve the Lord in magnificent ways? Fortunately, the Lord had provided means for us to accomplish those learning objectives. Throughout the history of the world, he has taught his prophets by way of parables, signs, wonders, types, and shadows. The prophet Alma declared, All things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. Therefore, we are surrounded with symbolic elements that, once studied in detail, can give us greater views about God, his kingdom, our familial relationship with him, and the glories he has in store for us through his plan of salvation. Allow me to list a few of the most obvious symbols for a personal study. I'm going to show you three slides here that I'm not going to have time to explain in detail in this venue. But you're welcome to log on to my homepage later this afternoon about 2 p.m. I will post on my web, on my home, under my homepage, on my homepage, a link to expand the transcripts uh, of this speech. And uh, you will have them, in fact, for those of you who served missions in Portuguese-speaking language, I will have a version in Portuguese as well, about 2 p.m. this afternoon. Just Google my name and you'll be able to find my website. But observe here how diverse disciplines like agriculture, anatomy, anthropology, architecture, biology, medicine, physiology, and sociology can offer detailed insights about these symbolic elements. The disciplines of food and nutrition and animal science also provide vital information for our study of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Clothing and textiles, geography, Geology, history, law, mathematics, metallurgy, music, and physics all can offer detailed insights about these symbolic elements. I recall past conversations with several colleagues from multiple academic disciplines about some of these elements. Professor Susan Barton and Russell Carlson refined my understanding of the mathematical concept of infinity. I once shared with Professor Daniel Scott my speculation about the interaction between matter time, and priesthood power. Thinking about the, prof the prophet Joseph Smith's statement that spirit is a substance, more pure, elastic, and refined matter than the body, I asked Professor Michael Weber if he could educate me on the physics of elasticity. Considering Morona's invitation to ponder, I often think of Professor Neil Anderson's convocation speech on increasing metacognitive engagement, or as he stated, thinking about thinking and Professors Matthew Bowen and Daniel Sharp have enlightened me many times regarding key terminology used in the original languages of the Bible. 
Since heavenly manifestations sometimes include music performed by celestial beings, I wonder what personal impressions professors Darren and Jennifer Durden and Daniel Bradshaw would have to offer about a connection between music and heavenly power. Could earthly sound waves enhanced by the power of the Holy Ghost resonate with the priesthood itself? Would it be possible for so those sanctified vibrations to cause a spiritual and physical effect on both body and spirit? Multiple academic disciplines can help us learn details about all these symbolic elements and expressions used in the scriptures and other sacred texts and narratives. Then, through the power of the Holy Ghost, we can enlarge our understanding of how they function as, God, as symbols in God's curriculum for salvation and exaltation, how they help us comprehend the language of the Godhead, and perhaps even how we might better exercise our discipleship and the authority of the priesthood in the divine work of salvation. Or put it in other words, all matter on this earth was created first spiritually. And as the prophet Joseph Smith taught, all things may have their likeness, and that they may accord one with another, that which is earthly conforming to that which is heavenly. Based on this, we understand that there are spiritual and celestial counterparts to all these symbolic elements used in the ordinances and ceremonies of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. By faith, we follow the divinely revealed instructions on how to employ these earthly symbolic elements, which through the official exercise of the authority of the priest within ordinances and other sacred ceremonies, are connected with their heavenly counterparts by the power of the Holy Ghost. The effects of that connection between the earthly and the heavenly may not be visible and are not visible to mortal eyes, but exercising what ancient prophets called an eye of faith, we visualize those effects, and in time we acknowledge them in our lives as blessings and miracles. Again, using the Apostle John's account as an example, he saw animal symbols also used by the adversary as imitations of the symbolic language, of the symbolic divine language. By this, John was being warned to dangers that would lie ahead. We likewise can avoid being deceived if we understand the meanings conveyed by the true divine symbols. Since the beginning of the mortal phase of the plan of salvation, the adversary has been usurping authority and introducing false, lim false imitations of the divine symbolic language via all kinds of apostate religious practices. As the years go by prior to the second coming of the Savior Jesus Christ, we can expect ever more sophisticated attempts by the adversary to introduce secular imitations of true eternal principles created by dressing up ever-changing mortal social norms and traditions with a veneer of scriptural passages to give them an air of religiosity. If believed, these secular lookalikes of divine principles could cause a reduction in the power and solidity of a person's faith. Only proper understanding of the symbolic representations of true principles can avoid that. The prophet Joseph Smith explained the importance of obtaining knowledge through divine revelation, saying, in knowledge there is power. God has more power than all other beings because he has greater knowledge, and hence he knows how to subject all other beings to him. A man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge, for if he does not get knowledge, he will be brought into captivity by some evil power in the other world as evil spirits will have more knowledge and consequently more power than many men who are on the earth. Hence, it needs revelation to assist us and give us knowledge of the things of God. Therefore, we see that a more detailed understanding of the divine language used in the scriptures and other revelations contained in the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ will help us Avoid putting our faith in limited earthly imitations of glorious eternal principles. And thus keep a faithful person exercising love and other principles in ways that will lead to exaltation and eternal life. 
The quality and durability of our religious practice or our discipleship depend on our understanding of the divine language. The weapons to safeguard our individual faith cannot be deployed in church offices and meeting houses because the battle for our souls is waged in the innermost recesses of our hearts and minds. 200 years ago, young Joseph Smith started a new personal religious journey and practice after a glorious vision of the Father and the Son. As we approach the beginning of the third century of this religious practice, we eagerly await the fulfillment of great prophecies about spectacular and miraculous events that will usher the second coming of the Savior Jesus Christ. Looking at the conditions of the world around us, uh, we may be justified in expecting these events to happen within the next 100 years. These events will no doubt cause great changes to our personal religious practices, and especially those of our descendants. Imagine, for example, the future restoration of additional ancient scriptures, like those containing the brass plates. We need to better understand Isaiah so we can be ready to appreciate Zenos, Zenoch, Neon, and many others. Imagine also the return of Enoch and his city of Zion. If we are to associate with the people of Enoch, we need to prepare by learning enough so as to have meaningful conversations with members of a 5,000-year-old society and learn about the changes in their bodies that allow them to have power over death or about the urban design, public utilities, and other systems of their millennial old city, including the interaction of priesthood power and gravity that enable their entire city to be translated. An intelligent religion brings together seemingly mundane elements to help mortal minds to have a limited but highly desirable view of God's environment. That allows mortal individuals to endure the crosses of the world while they wait to obtain the promised heavenly rewards. The insights gained through a more detailed study of elements of the divine language may help us better understand what the Lord has been trying to communicate through his commandments and covenants, and thus obtain greater resilience to our faith and greater trust in, uh, in God's living prophets in light of future challenges of an increasingly troublesome fallen world, and also possible organizational changes and doctrinal developments that very likely might happen within the next century of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I cannot predict the future, but I believe in the prophecies contained in the scriptures and in the words of Latter-day prophets about events yet to come. For example, I'm always thrilled when I read the words and vision provided by President John Taylor at the 33rd anniversary of the organization of the church on April 6, 1863. We believe that these people will excel in literature, in science, in the arts, and in manufactures. In fact, men and women will be inspired in regards to all these matters in a manner and to an extent that they had never have been before. The people will be so perfected and purified, ennobled, exalted, and dignified in their feelings, and so truly humble and most worthy, virtuous and intelligent, that they will be fit when caught up to associate with that Zion that shall come down from God out of heaven. It is evident that some great revolution, some mighty change has got to transpire to revolutionize our minds, our feelings and judgment, our pursuits and action, and in fact to control and influence us throughout before anything of this kind can take place. At the beginning of 2020, some might doubt and say, that's going to be tough. To which I would say, leave it to the next generations. After all, you and I may not be breathing oxygen 75 years from now. Before I conclude, allow me to add a personal note. This is quite probably the last time I will have the honor of addressing our entire BYU Hawaii Ohana in a formal manner. And this year of 2020 will bring significant milestones, not only for our church, but also for the Martins family. My wife and I will celebrate 40 years of our sealing, 30 years of our arrival in the United States, and 20 years of our arrival at BYU Hawaii. On behalf of my family, including my mother who is here with us today, I express gratitude to the good Lord for remarkable blessings and experiences. 
I also thank him for blessing me with wonderful neighbors, colleagues, 539 missionaries, and 10,338 students. Perhaps what I have of most value to conclude is my testimony. Uh, not a testimony of my, about the personal interpretations and expectations I presented in this speech, but a testimony of the reality of the existence of God and that he is a perfectly loving, eternal father who has a great plan of happiness for all his faithful sons and daughters. I also testify of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the reality of his atonement and resurrection, and that he is the only begotten of the Father and the Father of our salvation. I know they live and that they appear to the young Joseph Smith and called him to be his prophet. I testify that we are led by true prophets, seers, and revelators. I testify of the truthfulness of the scriptures, particularly the Book of Mormon. My membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is fast approaching half a century. And my faith and determination to strive to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ are as vivid today as on the day of my baptism. I pray the Lord's choicest blessings upon all of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Our dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we've been able to gather here today for this lecture in this, on this beautiful campus. We are grateful for the words which have been spoken, and we ask thee that thou might help us to ponder them in our hearts and in our minds, that we may gain knowledge and wisdom. Now we ask for thy blessings at the close of this meeting, that we might be safe throughout this uh, day and throughout this week and that we might strive to live the gospel 100% in our lives. And this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.